one thing that I want to say.
God do so much for us, and yet so many times we don't notice. We're in a season of Thanksgiving, but I said earlier it ought to be a daily habit for you and me. You and I ought to be in the daily habit of thanking God for all He's done. Sometimes we say, thank God for the small things, but if you think about it, there's really nothing small God does for us. Everything God does is amazing. Because if you were to remove one of those small things, we would notice it quickly, and we'd complain about it all day. Y'all with me? Amen? Sometimes I've heard people say, you know, we ought to thank God just for small things like cars, just, just small things like a car. Well, you wake up one morning and your car don't crank, see how small it is, amen? Sometimes we thank God for small things like beds to sleep in. Well, you sleep on a concrete floor and see how thankful you are for your bed. See, really, God doesn't do anything small for us. Everything God does for us is huge. It's, it's big. It's awesome because our God is huge. He's big. He's awesome. And sometimes we get so busy in our rut of life, we forget that God is blessing us with every heartbeat, with every breath, with everything we have. It's amazing what God can use in His creation to teach us about Himself. If you look at just a simple butterfly, we all learned when we were in grade school that the caterpillar goes into a cocoon, goes through an, an amazing God initiated process called metamorphosis. You didn't know people in Alabama knew words like that, did you? You're impressed, aren't you? <laughs> Go through metamorphosis, and out comes this beautiful butterfly. Here's where I think we can learn about ourselves and God. 
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that you and I are new creatures in Christ. And just as it's impossible for a butterfly to go back and ever become a caterpillar, it's impossible for you and me, once we are new, to be made old. See, what Christ has done for us has nothing to do with ourselves. It has everything to do with what Jesus did. We can look at a, a child and, and see so many things about ourself and God. I thought I understood faith. I thought I really did understand faith until we had our daughter. I thought I understood a, a, my relationship with my Heavenly Father until I had a child and now I'm a father. I learned so much about God and so much about myself with God as I watch my little girl grow up and I watch her interact with me and, and Kristen and, and other people. There's so much we can learn about childlike faith and childlike innocence. I love it that children don't have filters that we do adults. Don't you? I, I can't remember which candy bar it is, but the little, you know, all the commercial where the kid says something and the mom shoves the candy bar in its mouth to keep it quiet. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, whatever. I, I can't remember. What is it? Chewy stops the chatter? <laughs> Do y'all know what commercial I'm talking about or am I alone here? Okay. Moving right along. Like when the little girl gets in the elevator with with a bunch of strangers, they just got back from a cruise, and she says something like, that's my little brother. Mom and Daddy call him my, their little souvenir. Y'all know that? <laughs> Children don't have that filter, and, and they just say what they feel, you know? They just say it. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. I'll tell you a funny story. I'm not making this up. Miranda was probably three, maybe four. We were in Publix, and we were... <laughs> Chris, I heard Kristen go, oh, dear. We're in Publix, and we see a man dressed up like a woman. And it wasn't Halloween. Y'all with me? And this man had more makeup on than Tammy Faye Baker ever thought about wearing. <laughs> so we're sitting there, and thankfully, we we're in the cracker cookie aisle type thing. And we see this person, and we're maybe 10 feet away, and Miranda goes, Mommy, Daddy, look, a clown. LAUGHTER <laughs> We both like turn to the crackers. We're like, no, honey, that's not a clown. It's a goldfish. <laughs> no, right, not that there. Right there is a clown. <laughs> oh, man. But you know what? Sometimes we go to God in our prayer life and we try to impress him instead of just being honest. We wear these filters, you know, because we think somehow we're going to disappoint God. So we tell God how awesome he is and how wonderful we're doing and, and how much faith we have when inside we feel like he's rejected us. We're faithless. We're worried, we're, we're overcome with fear. We try to impress God, but there's this filter that if we say something wrong, He may not love us. And what I've learned with God is we can be so honest with Him. He's big enough to handle it. He's big enough to handle our honesty. And here's what I love about God. He doesn't quit loving us when we're honest with Him. Even when we're upset, even when we're depressed, even when we're afraid, even when we don't feel like we have a lot of faith, God just loves us and loves us and loves us. We have so many reasons to be thankful. We can look at a butterfly, we can look at a child, we can look at our own bodies and just see the, the, the amazing mind of God, how he put us together, how he, according to God's word, knit us together in our mother's womb. We can look at a forest fire. We can see new growth that comes from that tragedy. Where Kristen and I moved from, we lived next to a uh, Kennedy Space Center, which is a other than the rockets and what used to be the shuttle launch pads uh, is a preserve. And, um, and so there's just thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, a national uh, preserve sanctuary. So they do controlled burns every couple of years. And um, it was nothing to, to see a, a huge fire uh, out there. And, and I would go riding my bike along uh, out there. It was such a great getaway to get away and just exercise and spend time with the Lord. But Many a time they had just burned off a huge field and, and within weeks I'd see little bits of growth come from those ashes, little new growth. And, and I've often thought about how in our life even, how many times that you and I have been through the trial uh, of whatever, whether it's family related or work related or, or church related, we've been through a trial and we've been tried by fire and I've wondered uh, how many times we have that new growth that comes in us. From that fire and what growth would not have occurred had we not gone through that trial. So I, I could go on and on and on. The point is this, we can learn so much about God 
through his creation and things that he's putting right in front of us. And if we're not careful, we miss those things. Just like if we're not careful, we forget to be thankful. It shouldn't take a holiday. It shouldn't take a turkey. It shouldn't take, you know, a, a special emphasis on the calendar to remind you and me every day as believers in Jesus Christ, we have so many reasons to be thankful. Amen? So I'm going to do something I normally don't do on a Sunday morning, but I, wanted to, I want you to take about 30 seconds. I just want you to turn to the person around you, in front of you, behind you, beside you, and I just want you to say, you know what, I am so thankful this morning for, and you fill in the blank. I'm going to give you about 20 or 30 seconds, all right? Go ahead and go. Just, just what are you thankful for this morning? Isn't that beautiful? Now, church, let me tell you what I witnessed from up here. Let me tell you already what I've witnessed in 15, 20 seconds. Here it is. I've witnessed laughter. I've witnessed a couple of people shaking hands. I've witnessed somebody going, aw, which was my wife because I recognize her voice. <laughs> Being thankful and, and, and voicing your thanks, it just feels good, doesn't it? It's hard to have a conversation with someone about what you're thankful for and be depressed. Now, just let that 15, 20 second experience teach you something today, maybe this week. Next time you go to complain, next time you wake up and you just feel like everybody's against you, next time you're just having one of those cruddy, I wish it was over type days, just turn to God and say, God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. And you'll be amazed what it does. You'll be amazed. And if, if you need somebody uh, here to, uh, to dialogue with, you know, call somebody that you know loves God and loves you and just say, man, I'm having a bad day. I, I just need to, I don't need to vent. I just need to tell you what I'm thankful for. You'll be amazed what it does for you. We can learn about God. We can learn about his goodness. And we can learn about being thankful from his creation. We can learn about God. We can learn about being thankful from some of the most unlikely situations and people, even people in the Bible. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go to a place in the Bible where Jesus had some interaction with some people. And uh, we're going to see what happened in this story. But we're going to learn an incredible lesson about being thankful from the most unlikely player, a leper. This morning, we're going to take a lesson from a leper. If you have a copy of God's Word or whatever app you're using, go ahead and land on Luke 17. Luke 17, I'm in verses 11 through 19, and I would like you to go ahead and, and again, whatever app you're using or your Word, go ahead and turn there. But also, for convenience sake, I do have it up on the screen. You can follow along whichever one you want, but I encourage you, if you're like me, take notes in your Bible, underline, highlight, whatever you will do to maybe next time you're reading this passage of Scripture, help you remember some things that the Lord will show you today. From this story, we're going to learn some amazing things. I want to read it to you first, Luke 17, and we start in verse 11. It says this, now on his way to Jerusalem. Well, if you read this gospel in its context, you're going to find out Jesus is on his way to celebrate the season of Passover. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem where ultimately he'll be handed over to the Jews and they will crucify him. In other words, he knows his mission. He knows where he's going. And don't miss this. Even though he knows where he's going and what's going to happen when he gets there, he doesn't stop ministering to people. How many times do you feel like you have an excuse not to pay anybody attention? How many times do you, we, let me put me in the midst because I've certainly done this, how many times do we feel like we're too busy to mess with anybody right now because we're headed in this direction? Aren't you glad we serve a Savior who never gets so busy he says this, I don't have time for you right now. Aren't you glad we serve a Savior who says, I've always got time for you? I mean, how many of us run the world? None of us. And yet God's never too busy. He never gives us one of these, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of busy running the world right now. I'm kind of busy holding the universe together. Not just yours, but all of them. So can you get back with me later? I'm dealing with the climate on Mars right now. I mean, he, he never does that. Every time we go to God, he's there. It doesn't matter how busy he is. And Jesus was the same way. When we see Jesus in the scripture, we never see him having a bad day, having an excuse to be mean to people, to be rude to people. And so he's on his way to Jerusalem, he, know, he knows where he's going, he knows why he's going, and yet look what he does. He traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, verse 12, and as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Why did they do that? Well, a lot of you are students of the word, you understand they were simply going by the law. It was all the way back in, in God's law and, and back in the Levitical law. If you had leprosy, you had to live outside of the, the city. You had to live in leper camps, in a tent with other lepers. You were not allowed to be around other people. You were not allowed to be around people without leprosy. 
And if you were to come into contact with somebody who did not have leprosy, you had to give them a warning from a distance. You had to shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. And so they were simply doing what the law required of them. They saw Jesus coming and they stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice. But notice what they said. They didn't say unclean, unclean. Why? Because Jesus already knew that. And maybe they knew Jesus. Maybe they had heard of him before. Maybe they heard him teach and preach somewhere else. They knew he had uh, a reputation. They knew his reputation. So instead of saying, according to the law, unclean, unclean, they probably got this. Hey, he knows that. Jesus, have pity on us. And they even call him master. In verse 14, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. I think this is very interesting too. Here's what Jesus said. Go show yourself to the very ones who are going to have me arrested, unfairly tried, crucified. Go show yourselves, Jesus says, to the religious people who are my enemies. Well, they think we're enemies. I'm not their enemy, but I've become theirs. Go show yourselves to the priests. It's kind of a gutsy move. It's a very gutsy move because these men who had leprosy, they, they weren't even allowed to come into the city, much less go show themselves to the priest. People who had been healed of leprosy, people who had been healed of any disease, only went and showed themselves to the priest so that they could re-enter the outer courts in the temple. They only did that once they were healed. Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Well, they, again, they must have known who he was. They trusted him enough to turn around and go. It says, as they went, they were cleansed. Interesting, Jesus didn't touch them. He didn't even say to them, be healed. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. Sometimes I've had the pleasure of being a, a guest speaker at a church leadership deal or uh, preaching at, at churches and done, uh, have done revivals and so forth. And I've often uh, said this in, those, in that uh, context about getting in ruts and, and being willing to try new things. I've often said, you know, Jesus, uh, you'll be hard-pressed to find where he used the same method to accomplish the same thing. You'll be hard-pressed to find. Sometimes Jesus healed by his word. Sometimes he touched people. Sometimes he spit in the mud and he made, uh, excuse me, he spit in the dirt and he made mud and he put it on people's eyes and they received their sight that way. Sometimes he just simply said to someone, you're healed, be healed. And he always gave them credit. He always said, your faith has made you well. He didn't say, look what I did for you. He said, your faith has made you well. In other words, Jesus healed a lot of people, but he rarely used the same method. Let me ask you a question, church. You think God can accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish and always has to use the same method, yes or no? You're right. The answer is no. You guys are quick. I got to hand it to you. And since we're taking our cue from our Savior, you think maybe, just maybe, we can accomplish many different ministry things using different methods. The answer is? Absolutely. The answer is yes. Here's a lesson for us. Don't get in a rut. Ruts are no fun. They're comfortable, but they are no fun. Ruts are boring. Amen? Ruts are boring. They're comfortable, but they are bo o o o ring Four words. bo o o o ring Five words. I can count now. <laughs> so Jesus used a different, mealing, uh, a different uh, method of healing, and he simply said, he didn't touch them, he didn't say you're healed, he simply said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, that's when the healing came. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. And he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And I love the fact that Luke put this detail in here. We needed to know this. And he was a Samaritan. In other words, he was the most unlikely person to come back and thank this Jew, Jesus, for healing and Jesus asked, verse 17, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Look what Jesus called him. You're a foreigner. You're a Samaritan. Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, it was almost like Jesus asked the audience. It's almost like Jesus said, hey guys, did y'all just notice what happened? Did y'all just notice that I told 10 people to go and be healed of this incredible disease that kept them living on the outer skirts of town, that kept them segregated from society? Did you notice how they all were quick to go? None of them questioned me. None of them stayed back. None of them were interested in having a debate. They trusted me enough to go. 
But guys, did y'all notice that only one came back? So Jesus asked this question to the audience. He says, we're not all ten cleansed. Did I not do my job right? How come only one came back? And then he narrowed his focus on this Samaritan. He narrowed his focus on this foreigner. And look what he said. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, a reading of that, you'd almost think this man received two healings. You would almost think that maybe he came back still a leper, and then Jesus said, okay, now rise and go. Your faith has made you well, but that's not what he's saying. We'll get to that in just a few minutes in a little more detail. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. What was Jesus talking about? What can we learn from this? Well, from this story, we learned several things. They're on the screen. First of all, all ten had faith to pursue Jesus. All ten had faith to pursue Jesus. I know a lot of people today who are pursuing Jesus, but not necessarily as Savior and Lord. I know a lot of people, let me use another word, who are interested in Jesus. I know a lot of people who are interested in spiritual things. I've done a lot of sharing the gospel. I've talked with a lot of people, had the privilege to do that. And I've had a lot of people say to me, well, Pastor, I'm a spiritually minded person. Yeah, well, so is Satan. So impress me. Y'all with me? Say yes. I'm a spiritually minded person. Well, so is Satan. That's why the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we, get, we wrestle against the spirits of the air, the darkness. Satan's very interested in spiritual things. We call it spiritual warfare, and he's interested in ruining your life by getting into your thought life, because as a man thinks, so he does. If he can distort your thinking, he can distort your actions. I've had a lot of people say, well, I'm spiritually minded, or, well, I, I believe in a God. No, 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 church, we're not here this morning to celebrate a God. We're here to celebrate the one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob revealed to us in the flesh through Jesus Christ and then given to us as a deposit before Jesus' return, His Holy Spirit. That's who we're here to celebrate today. I know a lot of people who are interested in Jesus. I've met a lot of people who've been really interested in Jesus when their life has been hurting. Our churches were hard-pressed to find seats, for, uh, enough, have enough seats for people after 9-11. Churches were packed. Churches were packed. Because all of a sudden, our, our, our country was attacked on its own soil, and now we need God. But it was just a few short months, and everybody returned back to their normal life. You see, we're interested in God when our life hurts. We're interested in God when we need something. And I think about these ten lepers, nine of them at least. But I think about these ten lepers. They were real interested in Jesus. They'd heard about him, I'm sure. They maybe, again, as I said earlier, had heard him teach and preach. They were desperate. They had this horrible disease, the most horrible disease you could have back in those days where, I, I mean, certainly the pain and, and all that, but the stigma. They could not join society. And so here comes this man who's been known to heal, who's been known to teach and preach the kingdom of God. Here comes this rabbi. Here comes this good teacher. Here comes this master, as they called him. And all of a sudden, it's as if they were saying, man, he's our last hope. And so they call out to Jesus, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. Have pity on us because nothing else is working. And Jesus does exactly what you and I would expect him to do. He heals them. So they all had faith to pursue him. They all had an interest in him. But secondly, they all had the faith to do what he said. They all had the faith to at least obey him. And again, I can't help but think perhaps some of them were motivated, motivated by their own desperation. Perhaps some of them were motivated by their own desperation. I don't know why I can't talk this morning. I, 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 maybe I had too much coffee. I don't know. Keep stumbling over my words. I'll get there in a minute. Maybe they were motivated by their own desperation. They were thinking, he's our only hope. We've heard what he's done. What he's telling us to do doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We were expecting him to just say be healed and we were healed. We were expecting him maybe to touch us because he certainly has touched lepers before. But he's telling us to go show ourselves to the priest. That's kind of a gutsy, pardon me, a gutsy move because if we go show ourselves to the priest and nothing happens, we could be stoned. But they didn't argue. All ten had an interest. 
All ten had a, enough faith or perhaps desperation to obey him, at least at first. But don't you notice the third thing? Only one was truly thankful. And at that, he was a Samaritan. He was a foreigner. He was an outsider. He came back, and look what attitude he came back with. Praising God in a loud voice. He came back with an attitude of worship. He came back with a heart saying, God did this for me. He came back with an attitude of gratitude, that thankfulness. Think about your life for a minute. When in your life have you been interested in Jesus? Where are you now? Maybe there's some of you listening. You're just interested. Maybe your life is in the pits and you've heard good things about Jesus and you think, I'm interested. I wonder what he can do for me. Maybe you've even gone to the next level where all 10 guys went. Maybe you have had enough faith to step out and do some things. Maybe you've stepped out and, and gone to a Bible study class or maybe you've, uh, you know, done some kind of other good work. Maybe you've stepped out and done something because you had the faith to do that. But did it end there or were you like this, uh, this one lone Samaritan? Do you realize and did you realize then where your true healing came from? And do you have an attitude of worship? And do, you had a, do you have a heart of, of thankfulness and gratitude? You see, this Samaritan, I think, had a sincere faith. Not because he had an interest in Jesus. I believe he had a sincere faith. Not because he went to show himself to the priest when Jesus said, go and do it. They all tended that. I believe he had sincere faith because of this one thing. He turned back to Jesus. And he thanked him. He was thankful. And I believe that's what made his faith sincere. I've often wondered about the other nine. Why didn't they come back? Jesus said, we're not all ten cleansed. We're the other nine. What did they have going on in their life to distract them from coming back and thanking Jesus? We don't know. The Gospels does, don't tell us. And we could only speculate. We really don't know. But let me ask you. In seasons of your life where you have caught yourself or where the Lord has convicted you, where you found yourself complaining more than you've been thankful, what was it that was hindering you? What were those distractions? Maybe some of these guys were dealing with some anger. Maybe you've dealt with some anger. And I don't mean just getting mad and getting over it. I'm talking about some deep-seated anger. Not hurt. We'll get to that in a minute. I'm talking about anger. You're mad. You're mad because of uh, going through an ugly divorce. You're mad because you've been abused. You're mad because you didn't get uh, the recognition you should have gotten at work. You didn't get that pay, pay grade or pay raise or whatever. Whatever injustice has happened to you, you're angry. You're angry because life has dealt you a, a hand of cards you didn't want to play. I've heard that many times. Well, life has dealt me the hand of cards. Well, life hasn't dealt you a hand of cards. God has allowed you and me to go through things for our benefit, even though we don't always recognize it being for our benefit. But God is sovereign over everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly in our life. Church, if you believe God is sovereign over everything in your life, say amen. amen. Life didn't deal you anything. God gave you life. He breathed life into you. He formed you in your mother's womb. And there's nothing, there's not a single moment that goes by God doesn't know where you are and what you're going through. There's not a single thing that happens to you that God doesn't take note of and he cares about. And according to Romans 8, 28, there's nothing that can happen to you that God can't take and use for your benefit. But maybe you're angry because things didn't pan out the way you thought they should have panned out. Maybe you are hurt. Maybe you're not necessarily angry, you're just hurt. Someone you loved and, res and respected or trusted hurt you. And, and you've lost respect for them and they abused your trust and now you can't get over that hurt and it's keeping you from being thankful. Maybe it's discouragement. 
Boy, that's certainly an enemy of, of followers of Christ when we can just get discouraged. We do something, we, we do it with the best of intentions. We make ourselves available to God and to be used by Him, and we put our all into it, and already we have a level of, of expectation formulated in our mind, and when it doesn't, it, whatever the it is, doesn't pan out the way we thought it should or thought it would, we get disappointed. I've had people come up to me through the years and maybe when we've planned events or we've, we've done some special, uh, you know, emphasis in the church and so forth, and I've had people come up and say, Pastor, don't be disappointed. I, I know you were expecting one thing and, and it didn't happen the way you thought it would, but don't, de- don't be disappointed. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that sentiment, but let me, let me help us all out here. I'm human just like you are, and there are certain, there are times where we certainly have uh, a level of expectation up here in our mind, and when that d- isn't reached, we do get disappointed. We, I cannot talk this morning. We do get disappointed. I'm turning into an Auburn fan. This is horrible. <laughs> oh. I know what it is. I went with the seniors on Friday on that bus, and, and Barney Parker rubbed off on me, and <laughs> there's too many Auburn fans around here. Anyway... But, you know, we all could agree that we bring into a relationship or we bring into uh, a scenario uh, a level of expectation. When that expectation is not met, we get disappointed. So maybe you're just disappointed, disappointed in God, disappointed in yourself, disappointed in the way something fleshed out, and it's keeping you from being thankful. Maybe it's pride. I know I've struggled with that. Many of us have struggled with that. And I don't mean pride as in I think I'm better than everybody else. I mean pride as in, I can do this on my own. God, if I need you, I'll let you know. And that certainly wasn't what I, my heart, that, that's not what I wanted to convey. But as I look back on my life, I see things and, and, and that I've done. I see times where I was self-reliant. So maybe, maybe it's just that pride keeping you from being thankful. Because you want to take credit for whatever it is you've accomplished. And we could go on and on. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe some of these Lepers were wrestling with selfishness. Maybe some of these guys and maybe you have been wrestling with jealousy. Somebody has something you want. And so you get jealous. Or maybe it's just this, and I think this is probably true for most of us more than anything I've said. Here it is. Maybe we just get too busy. Maybe we just get too busy to be thankful. Maybe we have a lot of moments like this. Oh, I meant to but I forgot because we get busy. God, I meant to spend time with you, but I got busy. God, I meant to make a list and and, and be thankful for, you know, voice my thankfulness for everything on that list, but God, I got too busy. Busyness. In short, I think here's what happened to the nine lepers. While I cannot say for sure they were struggling with anger or hurt or disappointment or pride or selfishness or jealousy or whatever, I can't say all that for sure. Here's what I can say pretty confidently. Jesus asked the question, what about the other nine? Here's what I think happened. They got too busy to come back and thank Jesus. And if we're not careful, we do the same thing. So let me ask you this morning, is anything in life keeping you from truly being thankful? Is anything right now keeping you from being joyful? You know how you can tell if you are a joy-filled person? Just ask those around you. And ask people who will be honest with you. You see, sometimes when we look at ourselves, we see one thing. But when we hear what others who love us around us say, sometimes we, we get another perception that we didn't notice. For instance, you can look in a mirror two times, three times, five times, and what you see in the mirror, you're pretty pleased with. And then your spouse will say, uh, you've got something there on your face. And you're like, what? I didn't see that. Because they're looking with another set of eyes. They have a fresh perspective. Maybe you've got a friend who's loved you enough to come up to you and say, can I just, can I just share something with you? you? You come across like you're upset. I'll share you, with you a true story. About six, seven years ago, no, it's been longer than that, eight or nine years ago, not only can I not speak this morning, I obviously cannot count either, 
about eight or nine years ago, I was in a staff meeting, and after that staff meeting, we got out, and one of my friends who was on staff with me, he came to my office, and he said, hey, can we talk for a minute? I said, absolutely. And he shut the door, and he said, man, I love you, and I know you love what you do, and you love this church, and, and, and you're excited about everything that God's doing, but can I, just, can I just share something with you? I said, absolutely. He said, you you seem very upset. You come across very angry in staff meeting. Is everything okay? And I said, oh my goodness, everything's great. We were, in, uh, uh, we were just making some big decisions as a church, and I guess I probably was carrying more stress than I realized, and I guess it was coming out differently than I realized. And my brother Jerry loved me enough. Here's what he said. I'll never forget it. Here's what he said. He said, man, you've got some great things to say. You've got a, a, a ton of really good input but people tend not to hear it because you give off the impression you're upset. Here's what my, my brother was saying to me. No one's listening to your words. They're too mangled up on your actions. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I went in the staff meeting like beating people up, you know, like. Ugh. I guess I just had an edge and I didn't realize it. And I said, Jerry, forgive me. I am so sorry. He said, no, no, listen, you've not offended me personally. I just thank you for letting me talk. And we, we hugged next. We actually prayed together. And when he left my office, I said, God, I am so sorry. I know my heart. I know my state I'm in. I'm, I'm doing great. But maybe I'm carrying more stress than I realized. We were new parents. We had uh, family things going on, not between Kristen and me, but extended family things going on. And I guess it was just all piling up, and I didn't realize it. And I had somebody love me enough to give me another perspective. So it made me look at myself differently and say, okay, God, I had a change that needed to occur. And so I guard that very carefully. So let me ask you, are you a joy-filled person? What do others say about you? Do you have one, two, three people around you that love you enough to just be dead dog honest with you? If you do, ask them, how do I come across? Would you consider me a joy-filled person? And tell them to be honest. Now, if they take 10 steps back before they answer you, there's your answer, amen? It's like, here's your sign. We, as Christ's followers, we, as ambassadors for him, we ought to be the most joy-filled people on planet Earth. We have the most to be thankful for. Let me wrap this up. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you'll see it on the, on the screen. It says this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, in Christ Jesus. Let's read that scripture together. Here we go. One, two, three. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's a great verse to memorize, by the way. It's very easy. We saw it on the screen earlier when we were in our time of music, worshiping through music. Give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances, but during, while you're in those circumstances, even the ones that are not pleasant, even the ones that had you been writing the script, you would have written it differently. Give thanks in those circumstances. It demonstrates that you trust God, that God knows what he's doing. It demonstrates that, that even in the tough times, you believe God can bring good for you out of those tough times. When you give thanks in all circumstances, it creates a hope in you. Because you realize this trial that you're going through is only temporary. And if it's a physical pain, we realize that as this body is decaying, our spirit is being renewed and we have the hope of heaven. Giving thanks in all circumstances, it feeds our daily habit of prayer. Because it's hard to be thankful and to confess that thankfulness to God and not have an active prayer life. So it feeds that daily habit of prayer. It feeds even that moment by moment by moment of praying without ceasing. And then it leads to joy. You see, the other nine missed it. One came back. One, I believe, had sincere faith because he came back, he worshiped, he knew where his healing came from, he was truly thankful. I said to you last week, that the word we translate from Hebrew and Greek to get the word thankfulness means to confess. When we give thanks, we are confessing God's goodness. So how does this story end? I want to bring you back to one verse. Look in your word, Luke 17. Look at the very last verse, verse 19. I said we'd get back to it. 
And I'm going to ask the worship team, go ahead and make your way up here as I, as I close this. Because this is what I want to kind of burn in your heart today as we wrap this up. Verse 19, then he said to him, Jesus asked a question to the audience, what about the other nine? And then he narrowed his focus on this one man, and here's what he said. Rise and go, your faith has made you well. I said to you earlier, reading that, you would almost think that was the point where he received physical healing. But it's interesting, the Greek word for well used there means to be saved or delivered. And it's talking about the spirit, not the physical body. You see, all ten received a physical healing. But one received a spiritual healing that day. One was saved. One was delivered from his selfishness. One was delivered from his busyness. And he came back. And he had enough faith not to just pursue Jesus, not to just obey him, but to come back and thank him. And look what Jesus said. Because you came back and thanked me. Because of the faith it took for you to come back to me. Now, you are truly made well. You're saved. Being thankful involves humility. It involves confessing, confessing to God his goodness which then leads to life change. Being thankful to God involves humility. God, I'm not self-reliant. I don't have the things I have out of my own doing. I have everything I have because of your faithfulness and goodness. From our health, to our family, to our church, to our possessions, I have what I have, God, because you've allowed me to have it. Being thankful involves the humility that cries that out. Being thankful involves confessing God's goodness. And then church, being thankful involves life change. You see, when you're thankful, it just does something to you differently. You behave differently. You make different decisions than when you're in the pit of self-pity. We had a 20-second experiment a while ago when you said to your neighbor, I'm thankful for her. And I saw smiles and I heard laughter and I saw shaking hands. It does something to us. Now you go try that this week. Go try that this week. Get along with God and say, God, it was easy for me to turn to my neighbor in church and say, I'm thankful for fill in the blank. God, I want to spend some time just thanking you. Carrie's song that he sang a while ago. Thank you, God, for saving me. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes as I say each week not because that's the only way God can hear us it's only out of respect for your neighbor this morning I want to ask you are you thankful I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or do anything I just want you to get along with God for a minute are you thankful that God saved you I bet most of you in here could stand right now and give a testimony about how God grabbed your heart and made you aware of your need for him. You could stand and give your testimony. That's awesome. But there may be one or two or five, I don't know. There may be a couple of you in here who you've, you've truly never asked Jesus to invade your life. Maybe you've played the church game. Maybe you've walked an aisle. Maybe you've even, you know, done some good works in your life. But you've never come to a place where you in your humility have said, God, I've messed up in life and I believe Jesus died for my mess ups and I confess that. Now, come into my life and change the way I do things. If you've never had that experience before, I don't want you to leave here different. I, I don't want you to leave here the same as when you came in. I want you to leave here changed. That attitude of gratitude leads to life change. And the greatest life change is in inviting Jesus to be your Savior. To forgive you of your past, present, and future sin. And to give you hope for this life. A caterpillar goes through metamorphosis. He becomes, it becomes a beautiful butterfly. You and I in our sin 
we cover ourselves, we wrap ourselves in the grace of our Lord Jesus. We're made new by his holy blood and we emerge a new creation according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. You want to know how you're saved? You're changed. If he didn't change you, he didn't save you. So are you changed this morning? Are you thankful? We're going to have a time of response in just a moment. If you've never prayed to receive Christ or if you believe in your heart, your faith is not sincere. You're like these other nine lepers who never returned. It's going to be an opportunity for you to come and just make that right. And I'll be here to assist you if you need me. We've got others who can do the same thing. Maybe you're here this morning. You are saved. You do have a relationship with Christ, but you're here lately. You've just found it difficult to be thankful. Maybe you just need to refocus this morning. I invite you just to open up your heart to the Lord and how he would work in your life. Be open to it. Father, your word's been preached. It's now our responsibility to respond to you in a way you're leading us through your Holy Spirit. So may you be honored and glorified during this time as we worship you by responding to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Church, if you would, just stand with me. Pastor West is going to lead us. Worship team's going to lead us. Let's sing. You come if God is leading. I'll be here and we have others who will minister to you. You come if God is leading.